welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we're going to be talking about wills, trusts, and legacy planning. And joining me today is Bettina Lawton Esquire of Lawton Legacy Planning. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for asking me. So I was very compelled by the presentation you gave to my Rotary Club, mm -hmm. and that was probably about a year ago, and you came and really explained to us all of the reasons that we had not properly thought about <laughs> our own estates and assets and wills because it's not one of those things that we, unlike taxes or getting our medical mm -hmm. physical, no one calls us or sends us a letter and says, by the way, the law's changed. Right. You know, the tax laws have changed. Um, inheritance laws have changed. And if your instrument is over X number of years old, you need to redo it. And I think you left our entire club with this like, oh my, <laughs> oh my, how old is my will? Exactly. And I'm sure you encounter that a lot. All the time. All the time. People think, because no one really wants to talk about disability or death, although we're all going there. If somebody has figured out how we end up not going to the ultimate death <laughs> part, let me know because we can make a lot of money together. That's okay? true. But nobody really wants to talk about it. And so people tend to do it one time and it's like one and done. One I don't have done. to ever think about this again. And that's not how it works. Now, 60% of the people in this country have no will at all. Which is shocking. It is absolutely shocking. But most people say when they're asked, well, why don't you do something about this? They say, well, I don't know anybody I trust to do it for me. So that is a really key thing, and it's a really important piece about working with an attorney. You gotta find one you trust. If you meet one, and for whatever reason it doesn't really work for you, don't stay there. Find one you really wanna work with, because this is a lot of confidential info. Yeah, and this is not a will mill. No, <laughs> This is no. not a will mill, because there, when, when you start talking about trusts and medical directives and durable power attorneys, I ran right home and said, oh my, there are things we don't have here. Right. A lot of people think, oh, a will is enough. What I always say to folks, though, is, okay, you need to understand that the will takes effect when you are dead. Not when you're so, unconscious. <laughs> not when you're unconscious, not if you become disabled. It doesn't do anything. So if you, for example, have young children, and you, all you have is your will, and your spouse travels someplace, and you get into an accident, and you are now in the hospital, your nanny has no legal right to keep those children. Your neighbor has no legal right to do that. And so the, they're gonna come and take your child and put them into care until your spouse can get back home. And people don't understand, like in Virginia, it's not true in every state, but in Virginia, we have something called the standby guardianship. And you fill it out today, you say, here's who I want to give authority. It's good for 30 days. It gives those people time to get into court to get appointed permanently by a judge. And it's an easy thing to do. It's like two pages. But if you don't know about it, right. and you don't have it, then your kids are in jeopardy, and you need to do it. The people who have really old documents, which my cutoff for people is always to say, is it before 2010? That's because what you in, told us. Yes. There's, in 2010, there was a big change in the tax law. And since that time, in Virginia, there have been a whole host of other changes to the law. So even if your life situation hasn't changed, the laws have changed. And the documents that might have been perfectly adequate prior to 2010 may have all kinds of unintended consequences under today's laws. So. I say to folks, every three to five years or so, you want to haul it out, take a look at it, go see a lawyer. You could read it and say, oh yeah, this still is what I want, but you don't realize the law changed. And so you want to have a review and then see what you need to do. And sometimes it's just the tinkering. So for example, last July 1, Virginia adopted a Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act. We didn't have one before. And all those people, you know, you sign up for your email or for right. whatever, and it has terms of service. Right. And you always say, oh yeah, I read it, nobody ever does. But what it says is, nobody else can have access to your files, your digital files, or your photos, or your Instagram. All of those are considered digital assets. So we finally, in Virginia, July 1 of this year, um, enacted a law that said, if you do these things, then your executor, your agent under your financial power of attorney, or your custodian, there's a whole list of fiduciaries, can have access to the contents 
of your digital assets. If you don't do it, they get what's called envelope information. So they can see that on this date, you sent something to your financial advisor, but they can't see what it is. Wow. So, and that's brand new. So anybody who had plans before that has, in my case, my clients, have sort of the generic authority language, which I said when we did it, this may not actually hold up, but we're gonna give it a shot because better to try and succeed than not to have it and have no hope. So those things to happen. Uh, and that's what you always have to watch out for. Um, and that's why you can't put it on the shelf and say, I'm good. Same number of kids, same spouse, everything's good. It doesn't work that way. The law changes. And you know, and right now they're talking about, you know, tax reform. And right. so we're looking again, there could be substantial changes yes. to the inheritance tax. So key, key difference, there is an estate tax and there is an inheritance tax and they are different things. So an estate tax gets paid by your estate. So you die, you have a bunch of assets and you have appointed somebody to handle those assets. Those assets will pay the taxes. An inheritance tax goes against your beneficiaries directly. So if somebody leaves you $100,000 and there's an inheritance tax, you're gonna, you as a person are gonna pay the tax on that inheritance. If it's coming out of an estate and you're in, an, in a state that has no inheritance tax, then you only have to deal with the estate taxes. So it's different, it's a who pays what. Some states, like in Virginia, we do not have inheritance tax. So people here don't have to worry about it. In Virginia, our state estate tax, our state death tax, mirrors the federal. So that if you do not have a taxable estate federally, you won't have one in Virginia. That's not true in Maryland. Wow. So you can be looking here and decide you're gonna to move to Maryland, you're gonna to move to the beach. And you all of a sudden went from not having to worry about the taxes to having to worry. You know, that's, that's incredible to think about the fact, number one, people probably don't even think when they move from one state to another about updating their will, even right. though the laws in that state are different. Mm -hmm. The second thing is second homes. This just brings up something. So let's say you buy a second home that's your beach house in Maryland, mm -hmm. and um, how's that handled if it's not in a trust when you die? Real estate passes where it's located. So if you buy that beach house in Maryland, you have to open up a probate proceeding in Maryland. So you end up with one here and one there. Now, nobody wants to do multiple probates because you have to have a lawyer licensed here, a lawyer licensed there, you have to have a CPA being able to do both sets of tax returns. You, it's not something you want to do. That's why if you have any property that is outside of Virginia, and actually outside of Fairfax County, in my view, you wanna have that revocable trust so that you can put those properties in it. And what, the, what it does is sort of transforms them from being real estate located in Maryland to an asset inside this Virginia trust. So you still have to file the deed and do that type of stuff, but you don't have to go to court and go through all the rigmarole. Uh, the other way that people can handle it, and again, this is a new thing, that we only got in 2013. Virginia has now adopted a transfer on death deed for real estate. So your current deed now would say, you're married, it's you and your husband, you own it jointly. At the first to die, it goes to you. Perfect. But what happens is, at the first to die, the surviving spouse typically is so overwhelmed that the last thing they're thinking about is the fact that their home is now owned by them and there's nobody else listed on the deed. And so it falls into the estate, which raises issues on taxes and probate fees and all kinds of other fees at the courthouse. Uh, when you do a transfer on death deed, you take the deed that's in your name with your spouse and you add a beneficiary section to it and you say, at the second of us to die, it's gonna to go to my kids, or it's gonna go wherever you want it to go. And then the first spouse dies and it goes to you, you don't have to do anything. You die and it goes to who you wanted it to go to. And it just drops straight down, doesn't go through probate. And that's any deeded property including timeshares, correct? 
Oh. All right. So if you have, <laughs> if you Some, own a piece of a property yeah, that has a deed that goes with it out of state. That's you see. That is part of your key because sometimes shares are not considered real estate. Right. So what you have to do is you have to go to where is where is it and does that state consider timeshares to be real property? Right. Because if they do, then you've got to deal with it like you would any other kind of real estate. Right. But there are separate timeshare laws. So it's yet another law that you've got to deal with when you're doing it. The people who sell you timeshares usually know how it has to be done because they're always dealing with it. Uh, so you want to try and try that avenue first instead of saying to some estate planning attorney who's maybe never dealt with a timeshare from Georgia, for example, um, and has to start from the very beginning to research it. So you want to, you can minimize it by doing those kinds of things. See, these are things I just think most people are not thinking of. You don't, because people today, they're used to, they look and they say, oh, well, you know, either they've never done a probate at all because their parents are still living. Or they did it with their parents, but the parents had the house. Most of our parents had pensions, not retirement plans. So when the parent died, the pension went away. So you were left with just whatever's in the house and maybe some mutual funds, you know, and that's what you did. And so it was much easier. But now it is much more complicated. And in this area, it's really complicated because there are so many people. And when you go through court, you go through a part of the court called the Commissioner of Accounts. And we are very formalized in Northern Virginia about that. So there's all this paperwork you have to file and all these accountings you have to do. And if, if you start out with 100 bucks and you pay a bill for $1.99, you need that receipt or you as the executor is going to have to give $1.99 back in, right? There are other more rural areas. They're good. They, you know. <laughs> If you approximate it, it looks okay, they're not going to get all upset. But that's not how it works here. And they have, we have an entire staff that then reviews everything that you file. And at the moment, wow. they're like four months behind. So going through probate, it's not hard in the sense of all kinds of mysterious things. But you have to be really, really detail-oriented really detail-oriented to do it right. So all of that can seem kind of overwhelming to people. Yes. Like, oh my goodness, it sounds like it's too complicated and where do I start? And one of the things after our break that I want to talk to you about mm -hmm. is how you make it easy for people to step through the process. Okay. So please, after the break, join us as Bettina Lawton of Lawton Legacy Planning is going to be talking to us about the process for getting your house in order. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it. Mm -hmm. Drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. Why is my son having trouble in school? Finding lowest airfare to Istanbul. No, I'm tired of fighting with my son over his homework. Home, walk, restaurant, need a review? No, he's smart, but his mind wanders. Seven wonders of the world. Why don't you understand me? I do. I was trying to show how Connor feels every day. Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and joining me today is Bettina Lawton Esquire of Lawton Legacy Planning, and we are talking about 
The best time and the best way to get your financial house in order by looking at your will, looking at your durable power of attorney, your medical directive, and trust. And if these are not things you have, Bettina, how can people get started in a process that is not intimidating for how to get started at looking at these things they may not have? So there is a natural time of the year to do this, and we are coming upon it because, as you said in the intro, you have to do your taxes. You do. And the kind of information that you need for estate planning purposes, a lot of that is what you're going to be collecting for your accountant. So you're going to get information on your mortgage and where is it and how much it is. You're going to get information on what you were earning from your banks or your credit unions or your investment accounts. So all of that will tell you what do you have and where is it. And that is one of the big things you have to know. Really estate planning is sort of two parts. What do you have and the tax planning time frame. So in January, when everybody says, I'm going to get my financial house in order. We all say that. Everybody says it. You have to put estate planning in there and say, I'm going to do this because here, I made a copy of this for the accountant. I made a copy of this for my estate planning file. So that you collect it as you go along. And then by the end of February, you've got what you need for the most part. Because the second thing that you need, and you can do this over a glass of wine in the evening, who do you trust? It's not because you can tell me what you own. And I can say, oh, that beach house, we need to do this. But you know what? If I say, Catherine, we need to put that into a revocable trust, something happens to you. Who's the trustee? Who's going to step up when you, if you become disabled or when you die? And a lot of people think immediately, if you have a spouse, it's your spouse. Oh. But what if you both go down with the ship? Well, <laughs> either you both go down with the ship, or more importantly, say you have a spouse who is incredibly creative, incredibly absolutely phenomenal, cannot balance a checkbook, cannot read an investment statement. Nor are they interested. Nor are they interested. You don't want that person running your money because they'll run it into the ground. Right. And they can have their best efforts. But if that's not their strength, you need to find somebody else to do it. I always say to folks, listen, there's a number of different positions we need to fill here. So there are the financial ones. So the financial ones are the executors, the trustees, and the agents under your financial power of attorney. Those people, they have to be good with money, they have to be good with details, or they have to be good at supervising and hiring people who will do that for you. Somebody who's gonna get your medical decision making could be totally different because those are the people who have to be able to stand up to the doctors, have to understand what's going on, and have to be willing to do what you want them to do. And that should be one person, not multiple people. I am not a fan of decision making. Of course, many people have two kids. Right, or three kids. Well, at two kids you have an issue because the majority of two is two. So everything has to be unanimous. And the problem with unanimity is if you don't have it, you have to go to court. And what we want to avoid is courts who do not know you, do not know what you want other than what you wrote down, making your decisions. And mediating the disagreement. Yes, you don't want that. It is very expensive. The result can't be predicted because it can depend on the judge, the issue, and the day right. as to what your result is going to be. So you really, really don't want to go there. So you also have to look with the advanced medical directives. And some people call those medical powers of attorney, by the way. They're the same thing. You want somebody who can actually be there. I had a client once ask me if her child who lived in California could Skype it in. And I was like, well, legally, yeah, but first of all, won't the child come if you're in this kind of a shape? Because right. you remain, you have your medical powers and your decision making until two medical professionals say you can't do it. You can't understand it. You can't communicate it. So you're usually in control for a long period of time. I'm assuming if I am incompetent, that my children will actually show up. One would hope. One would hope. And if they won't, or if there's a long period of time, so your child lives in Australia, well, even if they're going to come, there's going to be a long period of time where they will literally be out of contact. So there should be a contingency plan So for there that. can be a contingency. Now, there is a form in the statute for this in the Virginia Code. It has not been amended, and the statute has been amended several times since then. You can name somebody in there, but you want somebody who's going to take, again, you take the basic and then you modify it to people. And so I have clients in that situation where I will say, here's the person who's going to make the decision until 
the other person can get there. So you're not left uncovered. Because at the end of the day, in, in the medical directive area, the Virginia statute has a list of people who get to make your decisions. And so if you're married, your spouse gets to make it. And if not your spouse, then your kids. And then if not your kids, it goes like to back to your parents. But at the very end, Catherine, is me, for everybody that I know. Because I know you. And right. we've talked. So I right. know what your wishes are. Yeah. You don't want me doing that. No. But you know, the doctors don't want to make the decisions. They keep, yeah, they keep looking for somebody who either has yeah, the exactly. authority or who's just willing to say, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Now, the other thing you have to know is in some people, call, talk, people talk about living wills. They are different than medical powers of attorneys. A living will, all it does is say, if I am going to be dying anytime soon, so I have a persistent vegetative state, I have a terminal condition, there's those types of things, let me go naturally. Don't artificially prolong my life. But you don't name who it is is going to make these decisions. In Virginia, we put the two of them together under the advanced medical directive. So you don't need two forms. I'm always of the view, if you can stick it in one, all the better, better, so you don't lose one. And the other thing that people have to know is you're the only person who can make the decision as to when you want your life to end. And a lot of people know about Terry Schiavo back in around 2000. And when she was 26 years old, this is why when young people say, ugh, I don't need I don't this. need one. Yeah, I don't need right? this. I'm young. I'm healthy. She had a heart attack in the hallway of her home when she was 26 years old. She had said verbally to her husband that she did not want to be kept alive. It was one of those things they saw something on television or in the paper, and she says, oh, don't let that happen to me. But she didn't write it down anywhere. So when her husband said this is not what she wanted, her parents, who were very religious, didn't want to let her go. And it took 15 years. You may remember. I do remember. A the sitting case. president got involved. Federal marshals were sent to seize her body. They it was she, debated on the floor of Congress. It was ridiculous. And after she did die, because the husband eventually did win the case, after she did die and they did the autopsy, they discovered that she had been brain dead since the very first day. So you don't want to rely on, well, I told my spouse or my children. You want to put it in writing, and you want everybody to know. I mean, I've had clients who say that their siblings will be running up the hall of the hospital saying, you're killing our mother. Nobody should be surprised about what you want. And there are lots of opportunities to talk to people about it. There are lots of books. As we've been aging, lots of books about this. I give my clients a little book called um, Choices for Loving People, be and it's written by a chaplain uh, for hospice. And he talks about these kinds of decisions so that people understand when you're saying, I don't want anything extraordinary done, here are the kinds of decision makings you're going to have to have. And you want to make sure people can do that. You don't want to name somebody who has a deeply held religious belief contrary to yours. Because then you're putting them in a terrible position of needing to act against their own beliefs. But then you're not also going to get what you want. So you really have to give some thought. So you can tell me your assets, and I can look at some strategies and, and start working on it. But you got to tell me who makes decisions after you. Right. So you don't have to do it all at once. And on my website, and people are welcome to go. I don't track who visits my site. You can go to www.lawtonlegacyplanning.com. And under the resource tab, there is something called estate planning questionnaires. And it will let, list all the kinds of things that you need to figure out. So you're going to list all the information that the lawyer is going to need about who's who and when were they born and where do they live. And then it's going to say, here are all these documents that we need to take a look at. Here are these assets, the things that you might never have considered. So what do you think that's worth and how does that work? And then it'll start asking you, well, who do you want for your executor? Or who do you want for a trustee? Or who do you want for your medical decision making? So you can start to think about, who do I want? Or you can think, I don't even know what that person does which then gives you the opportunity to say, when you finally meet with a lawyer, explain to me who this kind of person is. OK, what is a disability trustee? What does that mean? You know, And that helps you sort of organize your thoughts. Because people think this is overwhelming. And particularly, if you do it in conjunction with getting your taxes done, you're naturally going to have a lot of documents. And you can then come. And a lot of people will come to me, and they'll have the financial part figured out. They have no clue about 
agents. And I'm like, that's good. And we take the form and I start going through it. There are some questions that people don't understand. This isn't their job. This isn't what they know. Well, none of us are subject matter experts, clearly. Yeah, I mean, so you, you want to sit there and talk about. That's why my initial meetings with people are usually an hour and a half to two hours long. Because I want to make sure that you understand, at least while I'm talking to you, and then when you forget and you call me, I'll tell it to you again, uh, how this is actually going to work in real life. Because when you need these documents, it's usually because you're not able to make your decisions. And so we got to get it to reflect what you want when we do it. And that's key. So let's talk, we've got a couple minutes left. Let's talk about triggering events that people don't think about. Your daughter just got married. Right. Are we saying, well, congratulations, and do you both have a will now that you're married? <laughs> Your um, son has his first child. Do you say, oh, I'm a grandparent, that's wonderful. Do the two of you have a will that gives guardianship for your child should something happen to you? Probably not. Right. What about people in long-term partnerships that are not married, who might own property together, and then somebody passes away, and it's the parents who have legal rights, not the partner of 10 years, because right. the two of you weren't married? See, and that is critical. And I had, a number of years ago, a couple, a long-term couple uh, in the Springfield area referred to me. And the home, they thought they were dividing their assets. And so the home was in the one person's. And the younger person, who was going to survive, right? Right. Um, was he that. was on some other things. But he wasn't on the home of 20 years. And the older person died first. And so the house was intended to go to him. But there was no will. And that's exactly what happened. The parents who did not approve of the relationship came in, kicked the individual out. You know, and I'm aware of that because, you know, we, we have same-sex marriage now and it's legal, yep. but not every same-sex couple chooses to get married. That's right. And so that is this whole unique thing that's actually more common than people think. It really is. And I've got cl a client right now and they are not same-sex and they've been together for 17 years. And now we're sitting down to do their plan. And so that is the takeaway we want everybody to have. First of all, I want to thank you for being on the show. I want That's to remind people that this is not legal advice from Bettina Lawton. That's right. This is just general conversation. She does have a website with it has her contact information. And if you're thinking about what you're going to do to start out 2018, think about getting your house in order by planning your estate because this is what you need to know.